everyone and welcome to the latest interview in the Genome Giant series as we take a look at some of the work and lives of some of the most influential um, researchers within the genomics field. Today we're going to be talking to Dame Janet Thornton, um, a bioinformatics whiz, but before we do that Janet if you could just introduce yourself. Uh, hello I'm Janet Thornton, um, I'm a senior scientist at the European Bioinformatics Institute in uh, just south of Cambridge. This is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is an international organization spread across Europe. Um, I'm a computational biologist and have worked in this field now for a long time. So Janet, you grew up in um, Middleton in the UK. What are some of your kind of fondest memories growing up? So I'm afraid I wasn't a very academic child and what I really liked to do was to play out, <laughs> to play with my friends, uh, learning how to skate, going swimming in the local swimming pool, um, those sorts of things are, the, are my really treasured memories. So when did your kind of interest in, in physics like first begin? When did your, you know, when did you start kind of getting a bit interested in, in science and kind of think, oh, I might, you know, pursue that as a, as a career? So actually, <laughs> um, I, it, it wasn't like that for me. It was more that um, I, I knew what I enjoyed doing. I liked, um, I like to understand things and I like to classify things and group things, but I never thought of myself at all as a scientist, I have to say. And I, um, in the end, I decided to do, I did physics, maths and geography for our A-level at school because I was interested in the world around us. I didn't do biology because that was, but well, basically uh, the lessons consisted of trying to draw daffodils and things like that. And I wasn't very good at drawing, um, even though I love flowers, but, uh, but that side, there didn't seem to be any understanding in, in there. Whereas the physics was the thing where you could really understand about how things worked. And that was what I liked. But really right up till university, um, I did it because I enjoyed it. And then when I got my degree, I enjoyed it. And I thought um, I would go on and see whether I could become a scientist. But I was never convinced that was what I wanted to do. I actually always thought I would be a teacher. If you were a teacher, what would you, uh, what would you have taught? Like, was there a specific subject that you would have thought like, oh, I like that? Um, well, now, of course, I would teach molecular <laughs> biology. <laughs> um, then, I don't know. I, um, I think I probably thought about teaching younger children, actually, the basics, uh, rather than secondary school. Yeah. I mean, you completed your degree um, in physics um, at the University of, uh, of Nottingham. Yeah. What was it like being, like, in a kind of male... In, in a field that's still kind of male dominated like well, it, was, like? it was certainly male dominated then um there were no i do not think over the three years of the degree we had a single female lecturer um and in our cohort of students there were about 90 of us and there were nine girls so it was um Biased. I went to an all-girls school, so of course this was very different to being in an all-girls school. Um, but it was just the way it was, and I really didn't think about it. I didn't particularly feel discriminated against at, at all. I just got on with it. And fundamentally, science is gender neutral in terms of um, whether women or men can do it, they perhaps do it in slightly different ways, but the variety of the way that scientists as a whole approach their subject is radically different between different scientists. Um, yeah. And so it's not surprising that there are differences between men and women. I don't know how strong those differences are. So although I was conscious, there were yeah. many more 
boys than girls. Um, I really, I didn't think about it, I think is the bottom line. Yeah. I mean, what made you kind of jump from um, doing physics to then kind of going into more of um, biophysics? What made you kind of want to ch transition? So I hated physics practicals. <laughs> That's the same as me. <laughs> and, um, also, I really don't like machines. I don't like getting dirty hands and things like that, um, which sounds pathetic. But, um, but I was also knew that, in fact, so I, I had various options going through my mind. One was my project, my last project as a physicist was to look at the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. So it was more like astronomy. And I was always interested in the stars. Um, and at one stage I was going to do geophysics, um, but I went for an interview and the interviewer said, well, there aren't any jobs for women. There's no point you doing geophysics. Um, so I thought, oh, well, all right, I'll just do straight physics. But I knew that I, I really wanted to understand more about human, li about life on earth, I would say, nature. Um, and so uh, going to do biophysics seemed like a, a very good option. I didn't realize, of course, it was an extremely good option. It was a perfect option for me. But um, I just thought, well, and I got a PhD at the National Institute for Medical Research in London, and I was interested in medicine, um, although not practicing medicine, I should say. I don't think I would have been very good at that. What was your kind of, after you, obviously, after you got your, your PhD, what was your kind of early career like, and like, what kind of challenges did, did you face um, so, during that? So the changing from physics to biology was, is quite difficult. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, I'll, I'll change, but actually the whole language is different. So it took me quite a long time to settle in. And in fact, I nearly left my PhD um, because I thought I would be, I could do something more useful as a, as a hospital physicist. So I even went for an interview, and but they took so long about it. But in the end, I thought, well, I'll finish my PhD and then decide what to do. Um, and so for my, but and by the time I'd written my thesis, I was sort of hooked on, on doing this. And an opportunity came up in Oxford and I went um, from the National Institute of Medical Research to uh, the Laboratory of Molecular Biophysics in, in Oxford. And actually for me, that was um, a great transition. Again, you don't realize at the time, but um, of course, most of the early crystallographers, the people who determined protein structures were physicists. And so to me, it felt like going home. I was with a group of people who I could understand what they were talking about. I'd learned a lot, obviously, during my PhD, so I had a reasonable background. And I, I loved these protein structures that were being determined and they were just being determined. So um, that, that was really, for me, a very good transition to move into the, into the sort of protein structure world. Um, and it's really where I've spent most of my academic life. Yeah, I mean, many consider you a pioneer in, in structural bioinformatics. And I think over the over the past like few um, decades, that kind of field has really, really kind of like boomed. What has it been like to kind of watch that field expand? I mean, kind of being there from the, the early days and until and like till now. So when I started, there were about 20 known protein structures and there are now a hundred, over 170,000 structures in the protein data bank. So it, it, was, it was fun. I was, because Oxford was one of the few labs in the world where they were determining structures. And everybody, when a new structure came out, would rush to look at nature or science to see this structure because we didn't have many. Um, and of course, the, um, in, during my PhD, I done quite a lot of computing and programming 
which I learned as a, as a PhD student. And I enjoyed that because um, fortunately at Mill Hill, there was a very small computer in the sort of loft of the building that um, now, I mean, it's infinitely smaller than the power on an iPhone, infinitely smaller. Um, but that computer had some graphics and I could display my molecules and rotate them around. And I really loved writing these programs and seeing these molecules in three dimensions turn around and try to predict their conformations. And I think that's probably what really hooked me. Although I did experimental work as well, both in, in um, at Mill Hill and in Oxford. Um, but then I uh, had my two children and, and only worked part-time for many years. And it really wasn't very practical to do experimental work when you're part-time, it's very difficult, I think. But of course, computational work is much easier. Although, of course, we didn't have the internet or anything like that. So it was, um, it was a case of writing my programs at home and then going and running them and hoping that they compiled on the computer. Hoping that you didn't have a massive error, <laughs> error screen. <laughs> Absolutely. But in fact, that now, of course, people don't worry so much because they just recompile and recompile till they get rid of the bugs. Um, but that, that luxury wasn't, uh, wasn't available then. So you, and I think one of my proudest moments was when my, my program worked first time. No errors. I was so pleased. <laughs> but that's because I, I'd done it at home and I'd gone through and tested it and found the errors and corrected it. So it, it was, but it was, uh, it was a very different env computing environment then than it is today. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you've been involved um, in developing, I mean, several kind of bioinformatics informatics tools. I mean, what have these tools, like what kind of impact have they, they had on the field? And I mean, did you expect them to be kind of so widely, like, widely used? Well, no, um, I, because uh, when we were developing some of these tools, of course, it was less easy to share code because every machine was different. So, um, and the transition really happened in the 80s to 90s when people began to share their code. And um, I, I naturally, uh, I mean, I'm not boasting about this, but I naturally share things. It's just my character. Um, and so we always made our programs available and they have really, um, some of them have had a huge impact and, and many of them are used around the world. Of course, the biggest one um, is this suite of programs called Project that my long-term collaborator, Roman Moskovsky, uh, authored after we'd done a lot of analysis to, to know what to do. And this is just to check the stereochemistry of protein structures. And people still use it today. Although I have to say there are now more, I would say, sophisticated programs to do the same thing, sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, you've worked in many kind of established institutions, like as you mentioned, the University of Oxford, but also kind of UCL. Yeah. What was your experience like working um, at these institutions and um, how do you feel they kind of shaped uh, the skills um, that you use today and like throughout your career? So, um... So perhaps we should go back to Mill Hill where I did my PhD because that was a research institute, not a university. And I went to King's College actually to do a course in biophysics that was really critical. But I, that, that experience was in a research institute and um, it is very different from being in a university where you have the flood of students and you do all the teaching and that side of thing. Um, so I knew what it was like to be in a research institute and I was used to having, you know, access to a brilliant library, open all hours, you know, you could do basically spend any time you like. It was a, it was a really excellent place to do research. Um, but Oxford had all the students. So there were a much younger 
it was a much younger cohort. My, my collaborator, my colleagues, there were a lot of young people. And that, that was, I guess, fun. Uh, there, were, there were at Mill Hill, but probably less so. Um, and I guess in Oxford, it was being surrounded by the experimentalists who were determining the structures that was so critical. So I was part of their community, which I really liked. And, you know, still I'm in touch with many of those people today. Um, and then going, of course, Oxford, I was, uh, I've always lived in the same place in Hemel Hempstead, which is north of London. Um, and I commuted to Oxford for during the week until the children were born. And then I commuted two days. Um, and then moving to London was, of course, quite different because it's, it's sort of a central London university. And that also has really uh, positive, you know, I, I enjoyed going into, I know I didn't enjoy the commuting very much, but I enjoyed being in central London, being able to go to the bookshops and, you know, the British Museum is very close to Birkbeck and UCL. So, and, and Birkbeck, I, I went from Oxford to Birkbeck College, which is a, a college which does um, uh, education for people who are at work, basically. So the teaching was all in the evening. And so really in Birkbeck, there was a terrific, when you were teaching, although it was exhausting teaching in the evening, um, the people you were teaching were so diverse from all sorts of backgrounds, both um, ethnically, but that wasn't, it was just their life stories were very different and they were fascinated by the subjects and it was just great to talk to them. Then I went to UCL and that's a sort of a traditional UK university. Um, and there, I guess what I learned at UCL, I was kind of, in charge more and and so one's career as a, as a scientist changes very radically from when you're a PhD student and I certainly spent I would say at least half of my time on my own working either in the library or at the computer or whatever probably more three quarters and then when you become a group leader and you have all these people who are dependent on you then you spend a lot of time talking to people and sort of teaching them in a way, but learning from them as well. I mean, that's, that's one of the great things about research. It's, it is this collaborative effort and you often learn more from your students than they learn from you. You know, it's just part, part of the course. Um, and I still enjoy that part of being a, a scientist most, having my own research group. Um, and then, of course, I went to um, e European Bioinformatics Institute, which is part of this international lab. And so that was great because I got to um, work closely with people from all across Europe. Up to then, I would say most of my contacts had been with the US, which was good. You know, I, I spent a lot of time going to meetings in the US, etc. But less so um, in, in Europe. And I think that's because of the funding that we have through the you know, Horizon, well, now Horizon Europe, hopefully. Um, and so one, and there, of course, at the EBI, where I was director of the Institute. So instead of being just director of my own research group, I had this Institute that grew from when I joined, it was about 160 people and it grew to be about 600 people. It's grown even more since then, of course, um, since I stepped down. But so the science really is a constant, it doesn't change, but your role in this sort of scientific endeavor changes as you, as you get older. What was that process like um, getting, getting your job at, as director of the EBI? Um, like, were there any kind of like challenges that, that you experienced or anything kind of like notable? Yes, that's getting, obviously, yeah. Getting the job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the two parts, getting the job and then doing the job. 
Um, the getting the job was quite strange. I was sort of asked, well, would you be interested to apply, Janet? And I thought, well, I could do. And actually at that stage, I didn't think anybody else was interested to do it because it was quite a challenge. It was indeed quite a challenge. Um, in fact, other people did apply, but I didn't find that out till years later. Um, the challenge, it, it, it was going from a university environment to a research institute. So it's like going back to Mill Hill in some ways. Um, it was based, you know, the EBI is co-located with the Sanger Institute. So we were part of this genome campus. And the focus was very much on genomes and genetics rather than proteins and protein structures. Um, and so there weren't people who were themselves determining protein structures at EBI. But of course, there were many people within EMBOR within the broader lab. So, so that was quite a change. And of course, being kind of in charge uh, brings different challenges. Um, and coming into this community was quite challenging at the beginning. Um, it, it is more, actually it's, it's more, because structural biology has always had a lot of very senior women in it because of, um, probably because of Dorothy Hodgkin and all the, the impact that she had, because she had the Nobel Prize for Structural Biology. So there were, there were always a lot of both young and older women involved. Um, in the bioinformatics, which was, I mean, I think of course it started with protein structure bioinformatics, but for many people, bioinformatics only started when we got the, all the sequences. And, and that field is a very much more a computer science led field. Um, so it, it's a different environment and the people I found and the way they operated were rather different than at UCL. Um, it was challenging, shall we say, in the first few years, but one grows into it, um, I think, with the job. Uh, I did, when I took the job, I did it on secondment because I was, very uncertain whether this was what I wanted. But you kind of can't go back once you've made the step. And after two years, I, I didn't really want to go back. I was very happy because I thought the job was really, and I still think the job is really important to, to a TBI to do that both the research, but also the service aspects. So that, that fitted in very well with what I'd done before. Did you like enjoy kind of being being in charge? Because I suppose it's very different to being in charge of like just like a lab, but then this is kind of like <laughs> much bigger. Um, I find it quite stressful. <laughs> I don't I, I don't do it sort of naturally in such a big arena, um, but I love doing the sort of strategic parts and thinking about how the lab's going to develop and what we needed to do and how we might interact with different things and which part of the sort of biological world was um, where we ought to develop, where we ought to provide services for and, and, and that aspect. So I, I very much enjoyed that part of it. I also enjoyed working with the team of people that were there that was, um, I mean, it took some getting used to, but I think in the end, it worked out extremely well. Um, and, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of very lucky because I, I felt as if I've always been on the crest of this wave. So first of all, it was the protein structure, well, computing actually, um, that when I was a PhD student, nobody in the institute apart from me used this computer practically you know biology and computing were two separate uh, there, there was a theoretical biology strand, but in general there were very few people in the institute who thought about data or thought about computational things and so um, and then with the structures and them all pouring out and needing to be looked at it was like looking at 
a whole new world, a molecular world, but it is a whole new world when these protein structures were determined. And, and then with all the other technology, with new data, the transcriptome data, all the um, genetic data, the genomes, it's just, I, I sort of feel a little bit like a surfer, you know, and I've always been on the top of this wave. Um, and at some stage, of course, <laughs> <laughs> back down when it when it turns over but it doesn't seem to be doing that at all I mean the field has been fantastic to be part of from the really from the very beginning and to watch it grow and and get more and more and more important and it will continue to do that I'm absolutely convinced especially in the medical field yeah no definitely I mean you're still kind of you're still like a senior scientist like what yeah. kind of work are you work like um kind of exploring at the moment what are your group so, so the lab has got three three parts to it um one part and two of them are very firmly based in the protein structure world so um one area is trying to understand enzymes um and how they work and that's still very reductionary it's 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 going it really is trying to go back to what we know about enzymes to gather the data and to create tools to handle these enzyme reactions so that we can design better enzymes or enzymes that we need not better better is not the right word enzymes that are tailored to do what we we as human beings need or what the planet needs um, to to do so uh, those are the enzymes. The second area is looking at human variants and trying to understand how genetic variation leads to different people. I mean, it's totally fascinating, actually, um, you know, and development. And I mean, that's a fantastic area. And then the third area, which is somewhat separate, but has been, I've been working on this since I moved to EBI. Um, so that's 20 years now uh, on aging and looking at aging, which is totally and utterly different. And it sort of feels a little bit like at the beginning of the protein structure explosion. Now, of course, there are many labs working on aging um, and increasingly so for good reasons, because clearly there's a crisis that everybody's getting older and, and we all want to live long, healthy, lives healthy being the important thing so trying to understand how genetics influences probability of getting a disease or how it causes how it's linked to um, to your age why certain diseases have an earlier onset than other diseases is is fascinating and it it really involves it rarely involves protein structure data, I have to say. It involves all the other sorts of data. So I've learned a lot about the other sorts of data in uh, in looking at the aging. Yeah, I was going to say like that obviously doesn't involve as much kind of like protein <laughs> work, but well, well, do there you is, feel the protein is important for, but it's late. It's late onset. Yeah. It's it's the degeneration of proteins that causes the neurodegenerative diseases, but. That's yeah. that. That's not the bit that, in fact, we've been working on. Yeah, I mean, those kind of like three areas are kind of very like widespread. I, I do you feel like you're kind of broadening like your your skills and like learning kind of new areas oh, in more detail. Learn, one learns every day, um, but the things that you're good at don't change, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so the aging field is somewhat philosophical. Um, certainly in the past it has been with rather little data whereas the protein structure world when I joined was just when we were getting all this very very precise and actually incredibly accurate data and these worlds are just totally different in the way that they view things so, th so that's been an interesting experience certainly do you feel like you like biology a little bit more now? <laughs> oh, I'm, well, I've always liked biology. I mean, I love, you know, the natural world, just like I love looking at the stars or it, it's, it's part of human experience, really. And, um, and being able to spend one's life looking at the molecular basis of biology, which, of course, 
is kind of the same for all living things. I mean, it is just amazing. It never ceases to amaze me how, you know, DNA is in all the living things on earth and proteins are there. And you can see the evolutionary families, how these have evolved. So learning about evolution, as a physicist, one doesn't really talk about evolution. Um, and of course, in biology, you know, that famous quote, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. And it took me 20 or 30 years to really realize how important evolution was. So, you know, you, you learn things as you go. And, and that's, I mean, it's a fantastic job being a scientist, I have to say, because it changes every, you know, it changes. It get, you learn more all the time. Yeah, I mean, things are always kind of rapidly evolving and then you, you kind of learn, learn as you go. I mean, everyone's obviously learning as we go. Yeah. But um, late last year, obviously, DeepMind, um, their kind of alpha fold two algorithm yeah. made like a pioneering step in, in determining yeah. um, a protein's 3D shape from its amino acid sequence. What significance um, do you think this breakthrough has, has on the field? So I, th I think it will have a, a big impact going forward um, because now there is the potential to predict the structures for all human proteins, or in fact, all proteins on earth. Um, and not only do they predict them, but they do know how accurately, how accurate their predictions are. So some proteins they can predict quite accurately. Those, especially with large disordered regions, they can't predict so accurately. So that means that in principle, one can generate the whole of the human proteome, or at least 70% of it or something. Um, and, and that, in a way, it really, um, to me, it's just the beginning because to, to have got so far, I mean, it's fantastic. I am so pleased that, that this has happened because it's based on all the work of all the uh, protein structure uh, crystallographers and EM specialists now over the last, 50 years, and the fact that these new algorithms can take that data and learn from them properly. I mean, it's what, I, in a way, it's what I've been trying to do for many years. Um, but I, I mean, it's interesting. These, the people who are really involved and do this are real specialists in deep learning and how to apply it. And so what they've done is to create a pipeline that is new and different and clearly very powerful in its ability to predict. So going forward, there's no doubt that the, just having these structures will allow us to take a, uh, so the geneticists, the genome people, people on campus at uh, Hinkston, they all think genome wide. It's just in, it's almost in their DNA actually. They just think about the whole genome. For the proteins at the protein structure level, that's not been possible because we just have, we still only have actually structures for experimental structures for relatively few complete human proteins. We can model many more, but having really good models, I think will change. So the using this structural data as part of, um, well, I mean, the obvious things are for drug design, for looking at protein-protein interactions, for looking at host pathogens interactions, for looking at COVID spike versus receptor interactions. All of these things require knowledge of that three-dimensional structure. So we can really move into understanding biology in three dimensions. Up to now, it's been dominated by these linear sequences, which of course are fantastic to have, and it's just amazing, but they only work when they fold up. And so the whole of biology in a cell is a very three-dimensional thing. So trying to capture that going forward, I think will be really important, but just in terms of the machine learning, I think for the protein world, it is to do with the, the future. The next step, if you like, is to understand 
the interactions with the ligands, the small molecule ligands, metabolism, the interactions with other proteins, how organisms interact together. And that, that becomes much more tractable. What challenges do you think kind of still remain? Like what do you think kind of needs to be, to be done? Um, kind of like we have this now, what kind of needs to be done next? Um, well, as I say, uh, doing really powerful drug design based on structural data. Structural data is now usually used in when you're trying to design a new drug, but doing it overall, I think will be important, but mainly these protein protein interactions that the, you know, we only have as human beings, we only have 20,000 proteins, which is really nothing. I mean, when, you know, before we knew the human genome, people were postulating 100,000 proteins, etc. But we only have these 20,000 genes. The complexity of, of human life, in fact, all life emerges by the interactions of these proteins. And so very clearly, the next step is to look at those interactions and look at them in situ. So there's a big move in um, experimental structure determination to do it in situ, to do it in the cell, to try and determine the structures in the cell. But more importantly, to look at which proteins are interacting with which proteins and how those, you know, we still under, we understand a lot about development, much more than we used to, but there are still many things that we don't understand. And then being able to predict, you know, the progress of disease, to diagnose disease, to understand the molecular basis of many diseases. This will all come to play, I think, over the next 10, 20 years. I mean, the amount of data that we're going to be generating, that we, well, I mean, that we are generating and that we will kind of generate in, in the future is going to be <laughs> very large. How do you think we're kind of going to be able to deal with, deal with that, like, increased, like, amount, amount of data? Well, um, obviously, the emergence of cloud computing makes it easier so that everybody doesn't have to store all this data. It can be shared more easily. That's one point. I think the second point, though, which is quite important, and it's really at the heart of EBI and what happens when you curate data, is making data valuable. And that you know, if you do data dumps, often that data is not so valuable. But if it's curated and looked after and annotated, then it becomes much more informative. And obviously bioinformatics, I, I believe, has transformed biological research. I think now we need to transform medical research. And that's what there's a, a lot of effort to capture the medical data uh, more accurately and to annotate it more accurately and to share the data when appropriate for research. And those are all big, big challenges in the medical arena. Um, and I mean, obviously the main challenge is the, the privacy issues and the ethical issues. And those have to be faced head on and sorted out in a way so that people are confident that they, because most people would like to share their data if it's going to help somebody else, but they don't want to be recognized though. So they won't need to be anonymous. So how we do that robustly, I think is extremely important. Um, in the biodiversity field and the, the whole preservation of um, species, I think the new technologies, the new molecular technologies are going to really, again, change the, the way that we do that counting in effect. So biodiversity, people have gone out and counted species. You know, it'll all be done by DNA sequencing because it's much more, much more reliable and it's much faster and you, you can do it. So the whole, field. I, I'm actually a trustee for the Natural History Museum um, in, in London. And there, of course, they, ha they have. So we have at EBI 
incredible amounts of molecular data. At the Natural History Museum, they have incredible amounts of organism data, you know, species, samples, you know, bugs and fish and, you know, all the things that we go and see in the, in the museum. And up to now, those data have been, I mean, they're samples, they're not data. And so curating all of those. So uh, at the Natural History Museum, they have over 18 million samples, most of which are not yet digitized. Only a, a, a small fraction of those are digitized. So making those digitized, doing the same across all the natural history museums in the world so that we can really have a, an inventory of the biodiversity of life is, is something that's really exciting. And that will need the, the ability to store the data, but also the other things to annotate it, to curate it and to make it available so that new ways of handling the cli you know, climate change actually, which obviously impacts on biodiversity are, are found. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've received various kind of awards and accolades kind of for your, for your work over the past few years. I mean, what are some of, what is your like kind of favorite success story um, of, of yourself that you've kind of been involved in or something that you've achieved that you're kind of most, most proud of? Um, I, I, I don't think there is just one thing. There are many things over, over the years. I mean, I'm most proud of my students and postdocs. You know, they, they go on and do great things and, and it's great, really good to, to watch that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm most proud. I, I guess it's always the thing I'm just working on now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, um, yeah, it's difficult, really, to, to identify. I mean, yeah, I mean, you've done so much. <laughs> I mean, picking one thing would be, would be really difficult. But I mean, obviously, you're a Dane. So kind of what was it like kind of hearing that you were going to become a Dane? And, and what was the actual kind of day like? I suppose it's like a... Well, so, um, yes, I, I was actually, uh, I wasn't at home. I was um, babysitting for my granddaughter, uh, but she was at school um, at, at the point, and I got an email because they'd sent a letter to the office, which they'd opened. Um, and, and so my uh, PA at um, called me and said, oh, we've just opened this letter. You were pleased to know you're going to be made a dame. And actually, um, I got off the phone and I burst into tears because my mother had died three months earlier. So I was so disappointed that she didn't know about that. Yeah. Um, but the day itself was, was glorious. It was actually in Windsor. And I don't know if... You, um, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it, it was really nice and, and it was a great occasion. And then we went, went out afterwards with the family and had lunch. And it was very, very nice indeed. So it's, um, it's a strange thing. It's not something that one ever, well, personally, I ever aspired to. It never occurred to me, actually, um, that that would happen. But uh, yeah. Are there any sort of like notable people like throughout your career or throughout your life that you kind of felt inspired in, inspired you or, or kind of in, encouraged you um, kind of throughout your, throughout your journey? So I think you always learn from all the people that you're working with um, who are kind of in charge at the time. And you learn that they are all different and all bring different ways of looking at what they're telling you. Um, so, you know, my supervisor, uh, the head of the lab in Oxford, the head of the lab at Birkbeck um, have been important and obviously the people I've collaborated with. Um, but also my students and postdocs. I think I've learned more from them actually than from, um, I. Uh, I really don't have, 
in my mind anyway, I've never thought about role models. Maybe that was why it never bothered me when there were more men than women. I, it never occurred to me um, at that point. So um, to me, it's the people that I interact on a day-to-day -day basis that I um, enjoy and you learn and people, even people sometimes that you don't really like very much, you still learn a lot from them. And vice versa, well, I hope vice versa, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what are some of the kind of the major life lessons that you, you think that you've learned and kind of that's kind of built, built your character um, to obviously how, how you are today? Um, do what you enjoy to do, enjoy doing. Um, take the opportunities when they come and run with them. Make good friends and keep them. Um, and work hard. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no way around that last one. <laughs> it, it, it is hard work. Um, and in some ways, um, in some ways, it's kind of made it easier that I didn't have these aspirations. I see some colleagues who get very upset because they don't achieve this or they don't get recognized for this or whatever. Um, and happily, I'm not been in that situation. So everything has come as a delightful surprise when it's happened. And, and that's, I guess that's more, maybe I'm stupid, I don't know, <laughs> but it, but it, it kind of, um, it's just made my progress easier because I never expected, I never expected to get a job in science. I sort of thought, well, I'll do this and, and then I'll go and teach and I'll do this and, you know, and, and so on. So it, it's, um, it's been a, really, it's been a, it's like a fairy tale still to me when I think about it. I mean, would you tell your younger self anything? Would you give your younger self any um, advice? <laughs> uh, don't worry. <laughs> it will work out. But of course, you don't know that at the time. So, um, you know, you just just try and, and do the work that you're doing and keep at it. I mean, how do you sort of see the kind of field like evolving in, in the, com the coming years? Are you kind of excited for anything oh. that's, that's coming? Well, there's, there's so many things that are coming and I think it is this transition. Um, you know, we have in biology in, it necessarily been very reductionist so that we've sort of been taking things apart and trying to understand and I'm, that's, basically how my mind works anyway. So it suited me great. But going forward, it's now all going to be about putting things back together again to understand at this molecular level how life functions, how it evolves, how things work, how what happens when they go wrong. So the, there's so much still to do, actually. It's amazing. Despite all the work, there's still so many things to be discovered in the biological arena I think it's um you know it's a wonderful area to work in the whole thing about how the brain works is just fascinating and we still really don't understand we understand a lot more now but not everything about all the connections etc and many many diseases we might know this variant causes this disease or it's associated with it, but we don't really understand how you go from the molecular to the organismal. So it's this idea of crossing scales, molecular, cellular, organ, organism, uh, to try to build models that go, go up. And of course, this will be approached in different ways. Some people will come top down, the people who do organismal, like the Natural History Museum, can sort of learn to come down, if you like, in the scales. And the molecular people have to learn to go up to deal with physiology and all those things, which has been, I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't news. This is what everybody thinks. But, um, but the ability, the technology, the molecular technologies can now be really applied at scale. <coughs> so you can do the metagenomes, 
you can look at the oceans, you can look at the soil and see how it changes. Or, so, so all these molecular technologies are really going to invade, pervade, overrun the, 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 the medical and the biodiversity fields and the environment fields because they are so powerful but they yeah. generate lots of data <laughs> that's got to be looked after. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you said, there is still so much that we don't know and obviously technologies are just becoming so advanced. So it would be really, really kind of exciting to see how that, that plays out in the, in yes. the next uh, kind yeah, of few decades. But I mean, out, outside of kind of, uh, of your career and, and that, what kind of do you like doing in your, in your spare time? Like what kind of other interests do you, do you have? Ah, oh, so I... I love reading. I mean, it's, it's very boring, actually, the usual things. <laughs> I, lo I love reading very much. I've belonged to a book group for the last nearly 40 years. <laughs> and we're still what, what book are you currently reading? <laughs> we, we're reading The Stolen Bicycle, um, which is about, um, it's written by uh, a very famous Taiwanese author. And it's, it's the story of various bicycles that he's used and lost and a life story at the same time. But I'm not that far through that at the moment. And um, yes, I did struggle a bit with all the descriptions of the bicycles and thinking, well, I know why I didn't go into bicycle manufacturing. <laughs> um, so I do that. I, I love beautiful gardens. Um, so I garden a little bit, very badly. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not very good at doing things on time. And of course, in the garden, one has to be punctilious about when you plant things and, and everything. So it's very nice to sit here. That's the advantage of lockdown. You know, I can look out on the garden and enjoy it. Um, and meeting friends, really, and, and talking. And, and of course, my family which you know it, it's not very big but it's um i don't know for me it's the most important thing so no no definitely i i agree um if you could this is a bit of a silly question but if you could turn your kind of life and your career into a film or kind of a book what do you think the title would be called what would you name it hmm. Oh dear, I'm not thought about this. <laughs> I think probably something like the joy of protein structures or something like that. <laughs> have to get protein in it, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So and, and um, yes, it, it's that because they are so beautiful. I mean, to me, they are just like flowers. You know, I've got some daffodils and narcissi on on the table here and. And they are complex and they are beautiful and they're symmetrical and they're colourful. And proteins, well, obviously they're not colour colourful in the same sort of way, but they they're beautiful, they're symmetric, they 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 just are exquisitely designed to do do the job that they need to do. Um, and this has all happened through evolution. I mean, it's fantastic. So yeah I think that probably something like that <laughs> that sounds great thank you so much for um joining me today it's been really interesting talking to me talking to you and I mean you are an inspiration <laughs> um, well, throughout your whole career I mean I I just hope that that pe other people get as much pleasure from what they do and the the, the research as I have had as I've been lucky enough to you know to have in mind it's it's been fantastic actually thank you so much it's been great talking to you all right then thank you bye <laughs>